This is Dr. Sarah Boylan. She's a clinical psychologist out of uh, the Flathead Valley. Um, she, her, her service is called uh, Sweetgrass Psychological Services. She's also on the board of She Jumps, which, God, yeah, yeah. Um, she's been a great sounding board for me as I work through what is effective and how do we change or influence people, that's you, people's behavior in terms of human factors and decision making. So without further ado, Dr. Sarah Boylan. Here you go, girl. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Again, I did this yesterday, so a little deja vu, but you all look really awesome, so thank you for being here. Um, as Lynn said, I'm a clinical uh, psychologist in Northwest Montana, um, and I'm here to talk uh, about how your brain is trying to kill you in the backcountry. Um, so for many years, uh, with great thanks and admiration to Ian McCammon back there, we talked a lot about human factors. Anybody heard of a heuristic? Yes, great. Facets? Yes, great, we're not gonna talk about facets today. Um, and all of that has often like kind of come under the heading of decision making. It's actually like one of the sections in the Avalanche Review. And um, I'm gonna ask us to sort of like loosen our attachment to decision making today and start to wonder if we shouldn't be asking the question of like what do we do, but instead we should be broadening our thinking to kind of conceptualize this as like, this is about making sense, this is about how we're perceiving, and then it's about what we're doing and how that's changing outcomes. So it's gonna broaden your horizons, hopefully, and let your brain be less successful at trying to kill you. So, um, the reason we're moving away from decisions today is that what even is a decision? Like when we talk about decision making in the backcountry, it makes it sound like you make one decision that day, and that decision can either help you ski a sick line or can kill you. And that's really not how it works, right? We make hundreds of decisions. We decide who our partners are gonna be, what day we're going out on, whether or not we check the forecast. Like all of these things are decisions. And what that sort of amounts to is sense making, right? So sense making is this ongoing narrative process in which we are part of the process and as the process unfolds, we change our engagement with the environment, okay? So we're trying to comprehend, understand, explain, attribute, predict, all of this stuff within some framework. And typically that framework is the avalanche problem for the day, uh, our goal for the day, and then how we make sense of all of that together, okay? And then action or decision is not the end result, but one step along the path. And then after we make a decision or an action step, we evaluate it and we keep going in the same loop. There's a really beautiful article in the edition of the Avalanche Review that just came out. If you're not a member of A3, you should join and then you'll get that and you can read all about it. <laughs> Holler. <laughs> um, anybody snowmobile? Oh. Anybody snowmobile as well as I do? I'm terrible, keep your hands up. Okay, so uh, I think we all know a little bit about situation awareness, but I wanna talk a little bit about context awareness. So one of the things that we are really bad at as humans is remembering that we are part of the environment. We're really bad at it on like a like global scale, right? but we're also bad interpersonally. So when our partner or our roommate does something to piss us off, we look at them and we see the problem in them. We don't really see ourselves as like part of that dynamic, but we are actually part of the context. And we cannot forget that in the backcountry. You do not have human fatalities in avalanche terrain without humans, yes? And so you do not have human problems without humans. And humans are notoriously bad at thinking, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about perception. 
This is a bluebird day in whitefish. Don't move there, it's really terrible. <laughs> this is like our clearest day ever. Uh, but we get a lot of sparkle fluff, which is deadly, so that's fun too. Um, so uh, perception, so I think most people think of like sensory input as like the thing that they're perceiving. And it turns out actually that this whole thing happens in our brain without our conscious awareness, and then that's what we're actually perceiving. So the whole thing of like, if a tree falls in the wood, does it make a sound, right? If there's no one to perceive it, it does not have a sound, because that sound becomes sound when our brains make it sound. I'm not gonna get into philosophy. That's as far as we're going there. but. Uh, it's important for us to understand that like if you're, let's say you're out touring and suddenly there's a, a collapse underneath you, you hear a whoomp, right? The collapse is the stimulus, that's the sensory information, right? And then the holy hell, we gotta get the F out of here, is there a helicopter please, right? Is the perception that follows. Does that make sense? Okay, makes sense to one of you, so we'll go with it. Um, okay, on the left, saxophone player, raise your hand. Uh, woman, raise your hand. Yes, now do you see both? Yes, I just changed your perception. Did you see what I did there? So initially you had a sensation, and then I changed your perception. Middle, who sees a goblet? Okay, and a woman's face. This is a psychological assessment. I now know who everybody is in the room. I'm just kidding, it's not at all that. Uh, and now you see both, okay. How many uh, prongs are on the pitchfork on the right? Three, are you sure? Look at the other end. Are there two? Are you very confused? Yes, perception. <laughs> How many elephant legs? Yeah. <laughs> This is crazy stuff. We are really bad at perceiving. And these are drawings that people made to mess with you. The backcountry is an even more wicked environment than my PowerPoint, OK? <laughs> Has anybody never seen the arrow? Oh, never. Do you see it now? <laughs> You're welcome. You will now forever see it, right? Oh, yeah, right? You're welcome. I just saw it like a year ago. And now every time a truck drives by, I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> you will forever see it. I have altered your perception. Sensation were the purple and orange letters. Orange letters, right? And then arrow was me giving you a new stimulus, and it changed your perception. Are we clear? Perception is here to mess with you. Great. In addition to your perception sucking, we also have these things called cognitive biases. If you are a dork and have nothing else to do tonight, you can pull up the Cognitive Bias Codex. It's available on the internet. Every single one of these is a clickable link. I'll see you in two weeks, <laughs> okay? Social scientists have been researching cognitive biases for decades, and we have demonstrated all of these. There are four major categories that they kind of fall into, but there are dozens. So facets, the heuristics that Ian brought to our attention, are just some of the many ways your brain is trying to kill you. What is a cognitive bias? It's a shortcut that your brain uses to process a ton of information in rapid sequence so you can move through the world. If your brains did not use cognitive biases, you would not have left your house this morning because you would have been like, coffee pot, whoa, glass, right? It's kind of like being stoned. It's what you, it's like even no cognitive biases. You just get stuck on literally everything and the world would be totally overwhelming to you. And so uh, this is what our brain is doing constantly and there are some that are like really problematic for us. Um, Confirmation bias is a really bad one. Um, and Alec, I don't know where you are, but I don't wanna like single you out, but you like named like, we'll do the pit and then that can confirm our hypothesis, right? That's confirmation bias. That's what we do all day long, is we like think a thing, like my partner is you know not being very nice to me and then my partner says, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, see, he's such a jerk. 
right? I'm the only one. <laughs> okay, cool, let's move on. So the other part is that decision making is also really hard. And these are kind of the factors that affect decision making. And uh, I'm gonna go through them real quick. So attention, right? which is like, can you notice what's even happening? And then are you able to actually attend to that information? Like if you've been spending this whole time thinking about something else, like I don't have your attention. And uh, then we have memory. So can you remember the thing that you noted earlier? Like uh, there's some research to suggest we have a hard time even remembering what the avalanche problems are for the day once we get out into the field. Um, ideation is like your cognitive process. So that's what we just talked about. Emotion is like your vibe for the day, and sentiment is kind of like your vibe for life. So this is like climate, and this is like weather, right? Where's Gabrielle? Um, and so emotion is like, I am going through a really hard time, or I'm really stoked, or whatever it is. That can really impact your decision making, right? And then sentiment, like if you're a negative Nancy, or a positive patty, that can really affect how you make decisions. Like, I'm a like, yes person, right? My partner's a no person, and he's way safer in the backcountry than I am. <laughs> Additionally, <laughs> anybody old enough to like recognize this? Oh, good, okay, I wasn't sure how young you all would be. So uh, your brain um, has like a poor ability to process things when you're really excited. Who likes powder? <laughs> yeah, your brain's trying to kill you every time you see it. Uh, because your brain is really excited and is like, let's do it. OK, and then I put this slide here just in case anybody made it this far in my talk and is like, no, this doesn't apply to me. Uh, and if you did, you should know that even the experts in the world on cognitive biases will tell you that you're wrong, basically. So uh, let's do better. This is the part of the talk where like, you feel significantly demoralized, and now I'm like, OK, I'll give you some strategies. <laughs> oh, we're out of time. <laughs> so, OK. <laughs> so what's the best way to do better? So I think effective sense making. And uh, I listed some bullet points. I'm not going to like read everyone out loud because you all can read or take pictures and read them later. But the essential thing is that we need not to oversimplify. We need to like kind of be aware of like um, the bigger picture and constantly be challenging ourselves to think about that and um, using each other to that end. So talking things through, having discussions, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And additionally, it's really important to um, have ways to collect data out in the field, which we heard about this morning, right? Or earlier, it's still morning, okay. Um, but where we are kind of like collecting information from different points, it's really common that like in, in some of the groups I tour with, that like the person in the front, because they're way faster, or the person in the back, because they have more time by themselves, is like digging hand pits along the way. That means that one person is collecting a ton of information, right? And when we collect data, we want to be like scientists. We want to make sure that we're getting multiple points. So here's a few tips for like how you might have a good group. Um, and there's a couple big ones that I want to highlight, but taking notes is a really good one. So because of confirmation bias and because we're such terrible communicators, just kind of as a rule as humans, it's really easy for like one person to say a thing and then for everybody to agree with that person. So if you are going to dig a pit, you might as well get out your notebooks and like write down your own observations before you share them with the group. It's also helpful to write down the avalanche problems because research shows that you forget them. And we can talk about it or taco about it. So uh, when's the last time anybody asked you like a really good question? Was it a while ago? So we're pretty bad at asking questions. We're actually way better at just sharing our opinions. And I'm gonna encourage you to like think of a few questions that you can ask your touring or riding partners while you're out there to encourage discussion. And so that might be like as simple as, what does everybody think about this, right? 
I don't want you to ask a question like, does everybody feel great about this? Or like, how stoked are you to ski this line? Because what's the answer? Yes. <laughs> right? So we want to be asking questions that encourage discussion and encourage like um, disagreement even. Um, so this is a really important one. So establishing ahead of time with your group, what is the goal for today? Is your goal to get back to the car and somebody else's goal is to get to the top of the mountain? It's really helpful to know in advance, right? Doesn't mean that they're not a good touring partner for you, but you wanna know like what's everybody's agenda, yeah? And then I had a snowmobiling um, group I was out with, kind of a group of all sorts of people brought together. And we were riding up this hill and suddenly there was like powder on top of ice. And I was like, I'm above my pay grade, I'm done. I was like, I'm just gonna go back. And one of my friends turned to me and was like, well, what if we, or how about we, or what if we do this? And I was like, I pulled the ripcord, like we're done. And when we debriefed it later, she was like, oh, I thought you were saying no and that you just needed encouragement. And I was like, oh, we should have clarified in advance. And I'm the type of person that like, when I say no, it's cause I've like gone through every possible way in my head already. When I say no, it means no. Speaking of, let's have a sex talk. So it's also helpful to have a conversation with your partners about what these three words mean and to use these three words when you're out there. So do you want to ski this line? Will you ski this line? And I won't ski this line are very different things. You can also say this line is something in the bedroom and that's helpful if you're dating, right? And so, um, Want is like, yes, like I'm psyched, I am all in on this. Will is like, I'm a little uncomfortable and I think that warrants a longer conversation and won't, like no means no. Yes? Okay. Um, I'm skipping this. Okay, the debrief. So asking questions at the end of the day is one of the most important things, not only because it's like good etiquette to make friends want to ski with you again, but also because it's a really important process in integrating narrative. So anybody know what type two fun is? Yes, the reason that it exists is because we're really good at rewriting stories after the fact. So during the fact, that was heinous, and I walked for three miles with a chunk of sandwich in my cheek because I could no longer chew because I was so exhausted. And later I'm like, that was so cool. <laughs> we had such a great time, yes? And uh, if at the end of the day I say to my partner, I think we should have gotten an earlier start or I think I should have trained, <laughs> right? Uh, that's a helpful way of integrating this narrative differently so that the next time around, maybe I've actually like learned something from it. And one of my favorite questions uh, is, at what point were we most at risk today? I've been touring a little bit with my neighbor's son. He's 11, and uh, he can ride a snowmobile better than I can. And he always has the most interesting answer to this question. And it'd be really easy to just not ask him because he's 11, and actually his answers are so interesting. And uh, I've learned a lot. So I think that's a, and that, if that's the only question you ask, you did a great job debriefing. And then this is also in TAR, so maybe some of you have already seen it, but this is a Mad Libs that I've created. You're welcome to take a picture of it, and you're welcome to like bring it on your uh, hut trips or to do it with your friends. I'm gonna do mine for you. So I am a kind of risk averse but incredibly impulsive person by nature. I am motivated by eating dessert on top of mountains, preferably together. My goal today is to get home safely, but if I'm honest, to get to the top. And I tend to communicate by asking questions rather than saying what I think. And now you know a lot about what it might be like to be with me in the backcountry. And if Zach and I are going out touring and he hears me like, asking questions all day, he might be like, oh, this is that thing you do. I'm gonna ask you a question, right? And I'm gonna be like, ah, foiled. <laughs> and so, and also like, it's gonna be important for us to know. So I encourage people rather than using plan A and plan B, I encourage like plan J and plan P. Cause who wants to do plan A? Raise your hand. Who wants to do plan B? Nobody. <laughs> 
right? Because plan B probably sucks. That's why we didn't make it plan A. But plan K and plan M, like we have no idea which one's the better one. But my touring partners know that if plan K includes summiting a mountain and plan J involves a ridge, I'm going to always want to go for the mountaintop. It's just helpful to know about your partners. And that is all I have for you. I don't know how I, I'm sorry if I wasn't. <laughs> Who here wants to go for a ski tour with this girl? <laughs> I'm bringing cake. Yeah. Um, questions. We gotta have some questions. Make her talk some more. <laughs> They're scared of me. They're scared of you? I, I see one right there. Hang on, hang on. We get to use the toy. I like your shirt. Here, here chuck him this, Liz. Yeah. It's like being at a concert with a beach ball. We're gonna go small here. Oh, teamwork. Oh. I'm just curious as to what you learned from the 11 year old that you've been touring with. From the any, what? any examples? That 11 year old kid. Okay, so we summited a mountain. I, I think I've already mentioned this 17 times, but it's very gray where I live. We don't see the sun for like six months, really. And um, we summited this mountain in the last 200 feet. Um, we crossed over the inversion line. And it was this incredible blue, bluebird day. And we could see all of Glacier National Park. And uh, down below, we saw the specter of Brocken. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, because you live in the Flathead Valley. <laughs> so if you are on top of a cloud and you see your shadow on a cloud, a rainbow forms around your shadow. It's the coolest thing ever. I've seen it three times in my life. And this was the best display because there was a lookout tower next to us. There was this big lookout tower, this rainbow. And we were all on the edge admiring the specter of Brocken. And I was like, my riskiest part was when they were like jibbing off stuff on the downhill and I was like, you could break a leg and we're so far. And Clay said, I think it was when we were hanging off the edge of the mountain looking down and I was like, valid point. And we weren't skiing that side, right? But like, we were so enthralled, we weren't really like situationally aware or contextually aware anymore. And I don't know that I even like registered the risk that we were taking. Yeah. One, one more question, one from Scotty. Chuck that up, Scotty. <laughs> All right, awesome talk, thanks Sarah. So my question is, uh, it's kind of two part, but what is your ideal ski party group size? And what tricks do you have for in, with that group size for promoting true group discussion and decision making rather than group think? Mm -hmm. Do you have any tricks to get that, go that direction? Yeah, I'll ski with bigger groups if they're all women. And if they're mixed gender, I try to stick to three or four. Um, I believe that um, it's helpful to have a heterogeneous group. So like mixed opinions. I think that mixed gender groups are the most dangerous because the men think uh, if a girl's along, then it must be safe. <laughs> and the women are not gonna speak up because they're intimidated. Those are really broad generalizations I'm making. That's just based on my experience, not research. Um, my female partners, we talk about our feelings all day long. And so it's like <laughs> we get to the top and we're like, well, I already know how everybody's feeling, and I know what you're bringing, and how you're, you know. Um, and um, there are some people I'll only ski one-on-one -on -one with um, because of that communication issue. I think um, I really enjoy setting, like, we're going to talk at this point and make a decision about whether or not we're going to keep ascending or if we're going to. So, like, we set that at the parking lot or the night before on the phone call. Um, I think that's really helpful because once you're out there touring, like we're all out there to be outside and like enjoy ourselves. We're not there to like just like get it done, you know? And on the skin track, like you're off in your head, you know? Um, and so I think having conversations every time you stop for a snack break and check in about like all the things that are going on. I eat every hour, so that's like a lot of snack breaks. Um, 
And then the other piece I think is like really about those questions, like really being clear on how you frame them. And so you never want to ask a question like, this looks good, yeah, right? You always want to be like, I have thoughts about this. I'd love to hear everybody's thought. Did that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs>